Welcome to the World Affairs Forum and our inaugural virtual event. We're very excited to have um, Nick Vostev uh, for our, our kickoff virtual event this morning. I want to thank each of the participants. I see the list growing moment by moment. We're, um, we're closing in on, uh, on 100 now. Um, thank you each for joining us this morning. Um, when I was looking at the registration list, I was very happy. It made me uh, it made me feel like I was in com the company of friends to see so many familiar names. But I was also really very happy to see so many names that are new to me on the list. I know that there are a lot of people um, on our mailing list who um, have trouble getting to our events, and I'm hoping that, um, given the downside of the um, disruption of this pandemic, that we are also um, challenging ourselves to look for the opportunities. Um, and of course, in that vein is this opportunity to reach people um, because we've been forced into these new platforms. So we welcome all of you who are new to our programs. Before we get started, um, I want to thank a lot of the people that support the World Affairs Forum. Um, I did put an intro in the chat for those of you that are not familiar with the forum. Um, our background, what we are and what we do. We work in um, Westchester and Fairfield counties to increase awareness of global affairs. Um, we have, um, for our support, we're a nonpartisan organization that um, is not for profit, and we look to local sponsors, uh, local supporters, and membership to support us. So we want to thank each of those groups of people, um, in particular today, as we are, like everybody else, struggling to find our way in this new era. Um, we, uh, in particular, want to thank our members who um, will be in the next month or so most likely seeing some communications, um, asking them to renew their membership. I hope you will consider uh, supporting us for the year coming forward as we um, look to our membership for feedback on how to best engage you and help fill in the gaps in information um, during uh, the pandemic and the disconnection, but also at the same time, um, ironically, the, um, the overload of information that we are um, finding ourselves in during this time. Uh, so thank you to everyone who supports the forum. Uh, this morning, we are so pleased to have with us Nicholas uh, Gavostev, um, who will be discussing the 2020 pandemic um, and fractured globalization and the future of the international system. Uh, this is not a conversation that he is new to. This is continuing and um, he will be addressing it in light of COVID-19 and where we find ourselves in relation to that. A little background on him. He is a Carnegie Council Senior Fellow with the US Global Engagement Program. He's a professor of national security affairs at the US Naval War College. He was editor of The National Interest, and he remains a senior editor at that magazine. Uh, he co-author of a book uh, called U.S. Foreign Policy and Defense Strategy, The Evolution of an Incidental Superpower, which was dated 2015. And in 2013, he published with uh, Christopher Marsh a book called Russian Foreign Policy Interests, Vectors, and Sectors. Uh, which uh, helps to give you a little bit of the intersectionality of um, how he approaches these subjects. Also, uh, just to give you a bit of structure to what we're doing this morning online with us behind the scenes, or maybe not completely behind the scenes, is Billy Pickett, who is Program and Digital Communications Associate at Carnegie Council. Uh, Billy will be taking over right after um, uh, Mr. Gostev's initial presentation, he'll be managing the Q&A for us. So I will see you back at the wrap up in an hour um, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, several uh, appearances ago in Stanford uh, when you had me coming in to talk about about uh, U.S.-Russia relations, I made I made a crack that it wasn't uh, time yet to start digging your your bomb shelters, and of course now it looks like I'm in a bunker in a undisclosed location to ride out the uh, effects of the pandemic. So uh, this is uh, my my choice of location shouldn't be uh, taken as a cause for alarm that the uh, the world is coming to an end anytime soon. Uh, but the pandemic is stressing the global system. It is causing us to reconsider some of the assumptions we have made about the way that the world has been moving uh, 
from the end of the Cold War. Uh, we used to talk about uh, a period known as that uh, uh, Jim Golgeyer and Derek Cholet coined from 11-9 to 9-11. That is 11-9, November 9th was 1989 was the date that the Berlin Wall opened. And so they used that as a starting point for the end of the Cold War all the way up to 9-11. And then the argument was that 9-11 uh, was such a, a shock, uh, not simply to the United States, but to the world as a whole that uh, stateless terrorist organizations could nonetheless uh, acquire the means to deliver death on a mass scale uh, that previously we had assumed was only uh, capable for states and that this uh, seemed to, to open up a new era where uh, we would face challenges of uh, terrorist organizations and the breaking apart of weak states and uh, the line in the early 2000s was the United States is threatened more by weak states than by strong states and that all of the major powers are coming together to uh, work to, to try to uh, create global order. Uh, that kind of faded uh, by certainly the, the beginning of the second term of the Obama administration for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, the U.S. decision to go into Iraq in 2003, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, uh, the sense that uh, we were returning to an era uh, of great power competition. Uh, and of course, the real interesting test there is uh, to watch how quickly a term is used and reused in media and in strategic documents and in op-eds and in the things that I do, you know, how many times do pundits say it? How many times do we start using it as a session in, in the classroom? And uh, uh, Uri Feldman had a wonderful piece in the Atlantic last year where actually he tracks, says, you know, great power competition. You don't really hear much of it again in the early 2000s because the emphasis is on terrorism and weak states and failing states uh, starts to tick up after 2008, and then of course, uh, Russia goes into Ukraine, China becomes much more assertive, and uh, you know, then the term explodes by 2016, 2017, and everyone is talking about great power competition, and this is now the shape of the, of the world order. Uh, it's going to be the United States and its allies against the axis of authoritarians, as some called it. And the question now is whether, you know, that era or that period is giving way. And, and some people have commented that maybe March 11th, uh, sort of picking an arbitrary date, uh, but 3-11-20 uh, might become yet another marking point because March 11th is really the date, at least within the United States, uh, that the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really starts to have an impact on how we, how we live, how we do business, uh, it's when we start seeing uh, uh, the beginnings of stay-at-home orders, lockdown orders. Uh, we start to see major interruptions in uh, our you know, ability to travel. Uh, it's when we start first having uh, signs of, of uh, at least panic buying. Uh, events start getting canceled. Uh, so on and so forth. So the, some people have said, you know, if, if we had 11-9 to 9-11, is there also sort of a 9-11 to 3-11 or, you know, 2001 to 2020? And does the, does the pandemic uh, create new conditions uh, for how we're going to view international affairs? Uh, certainly, uh, just as someone who follows this and is an educator, uh, it really has seemed that the, 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 the last two months, and really we haven't even reached a two month period between March 11th, again, it's an arbitrary date, but the extent to which that seems to be the, really the first, uh, where the first major steps get taken uh, in combating the pandemic. Uh, you know, we haven't even reached a two month period and yet uh, February, January, February, uh, early March seem very distant now. Uh, as almost as if they they existed in a in a past century, and we, we kind of had that feeling after 9/11, the sense that uh, the world as it existed on September 10th and the world as it existed on September 12th felt very different, uh, at least initially. And so this sense of are we now once again having this uh, a major shock, and we might term the pandemic not a black swan because a black swan event, if we're using the uh, um, uh, 
Nicholas Nassim Talib uh, nomenclature. A black swan is a, is an unexpected event uh, that uh, bursts onto the scene with with major ramifications. Uh, I would say that the pandemic is more of what we might say is a gray swan event, which is that we we've known for years that. Uh, Nature uh, in the form of viruses is coming up with new and innovative ways to uh, uh, to, to deal with human beings uh, and that uh, as we have created a more globalized network uh, of travel, communication, uh, movement of goods and services, movement of people, uh, it, uh, it breaks down uh, what traditionally were some of the barriers to, to global pandemics, which was geographic isolation. Uh, so we've known that this has been a problem. Uh, we knew that this was a threat that was looming on the horizon, but we couldn't predict a particular time, a particular virus, a particular set of symptoms. So in, in that regard, this is a gray swan, not a black swan. It's a swan that we, we were aware was lurking, um, but we just didn't, we, we couldn't say with any certainty that on this date and time, this particular virus will emerge and it will have an impact uh, in this sense. Uh, but it is, uh, so it's, a, it's a, a gray swan event that we're dealing with now. Uh, and we're looking at how it's impacting uh, the international system. And so let me, uh, let me give a couple of uh, opening propositions uh, that we can discuss, debate, uh, examine, counter uh, as we move forward uh, in, in the weeks and months and, and years to come. Uh, and the first is, is that uh, the pandemic uh, is fracturing globalization. It's not ending globalization. It's not as if we're going to revert back to uh, autarky, where everyone sort of goes back into their own into their own shells and, and don't communicate and don't trade. Uh, but I think uh, we are going to be revisiting a series of gambles that we took from the 1990s onward with regard to to the global system, and and those gambles were that you could create a relatively seamless global economic system, that you could drop barriers, uh, certainly to trade, but also to travel with, uh, with not too many ramifications, uh, that people could move easily from one place to the other, that you could develop and maintain a series of very elongated supply chains, where you could source components and materials from uh, the most cost effective place uh, and then just have it move along a supply chain uh, until you got to a finished good or service and and where you know how long that chain was wasn 't necessarily seen as a risk or as a problem anymore uh, that you could you know if we look for example at boeing 's dreamliner uh, you know the seven eighty seven and you look at really the global supply chain to create that aircraft and really there 's no region of the world that isn't contributing something to the Dreamliner, whether it's the titanium from Russia, whether it's design bureaus uh, in Japan uh, or Israel, uh, whether it is, you know, assembly of particular components in Southeast Asia or in Mexico or in Brazil, and then transporting it and, and final assembly and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the pandemic is pointing out that what happens when those supply chains get interrupted or ruptured, when suddenly you have a travel ban, uh, borders come back up. Uh, it's amazing how uh, in January people would talk about we live in a borderless world, and then in, in March we're discovering how quickly borders can return checkpoints return, travel bans come in, your ability to get on an airplane and fly from point A to point B is now uh, no longer in your hands because a government may say, we don't want you crossing our frontiers uh, or we're not going to permit this plane to land or certainly we're all familiar with the, uh, the, the tragedy of the cruise ships that couldn't find ports to dock and were we're, we're essentially on the high seas for days or even weeks uh, as government after government said, uh, nope, you're not docking your ship here. Uh, so much for a you know, borderless world where we move seamlessly from place to place until uh, it's not a borderless world. So that may cause us to reevaluate the length of some of our supply chains, um, whether or not uh, paying a bit more uh, 
uh, for a good or service in order to have a smaller supply chain or a more compact supply chain uh, plays out. Uh, it raised the question of, um, and this was a question that was already in the agenda. It was certainly part of the uh, 2016 election campaign, both within the Democratic primary and then and the Republican primary, and then in, it came out as well in the general election, which is, uh, is the U.S. Uh, over-dependent uh, on China for critical goods and services? Have we allowed a, an economic dependency to develop uh, that is not buttressed by uh, the appropriate uh, political safeguards. It's one thing for the United States to have a, a dense trading relationship uh, with Canada or with France or with Britain, uh, countries with which we don't, we already share uh, a number of uh, similar forms of government, similar expectations, similar uh, adherence to principles about rule of law. Uh, it's another thing if you have allowed a, a certain degree of dependence to open up with a major power uh, that perhaps sees the world in very different terms than you do. Um, those were debates that were already happening. The pandemic is accelerating them. And now it has become much more mainstream uh, to talk about decoupling uh, to what extent, not severance, but decoupling to some extent. That is that uh, the US and China uh, ought to reevaluate the extent of their connectivity uh, and maybe reorient. And by the way, it's not just a debate within the United States. Uh, we often have a U.S. centric view that the U.S. will decouple from China. Uh, China's also looking at you know, decoupling from the United States. Uh, should they depend on the United States as much for food imports? Should they depend on the United States uh, for energy? Uh, because a critical part of the U.S. China trade deal that was reached last year. Uh, that is probably a dead letter now, was that uh, China would import more energy from the United States. Um, instead, what we saw in the last uh, weeks of March uh, was China uh, massively ramping up its purchases of energy from Russia. Uh, so the energy that they were going to buy from the United States, uh, instead uh, they turned to their neighbor to the north and said, uh, can you supply, and of course in conditions of a glut, as we've seen in, in oil markets, uh, the Russians were more than happy to oblige uh, by sending uh, more shipments of, of, of energy uh, to China. So the Chinese may be decoupling as well. Uh, again, not severing ties, but a, a certain degree uh, of decoupling. So that's the first overarching question is to what extent are we going to see uh, a recalibration, a reevaluation of the, of the ties that countries have with each other? Uh, are we going to see a, a pulling back uh, to more, I don't want to say this in military terms, but it, it sounds quasi-military, of more defensible supply lines and supply chains, uh, reorient so that uh, we are uh, purchasing more goods and services uh, from allies and partners, uh, and similarly, will other countries do the same thing? So that's uh, that's the first uh, first question that we have. The second uh, is uh, the question of solidarity and alliances and commitments. Um, we had just had the NATO summit uh, in December of last year, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and of course, uh, this is one of the premier events where. Uh, the United States and Canada and uh, the major countries of Europe all reaffirm we are all together, we are uh, one team, we are uh, friends and allies who have each other's backs. Uh, the European Union, of course, is based very much on uh, this concept of uh, solidarity of the members, so that if something bothers Sweden, it should be of concern to Portugal, and if Greece is having a problem, this is why the Irish should care. Uh, and this has been touted as the strength of the European Union, uh, that this is an association which is transcending the nation state. Uh, and again, these were commonplace declarations uh, until the pandemic hit. And then uh, we discovered how strong or how weak the bonds of solidarity are, uh, that uh, solidarity only goes so far uh, when you are dealing with a problem that impacts everyone. Uh, suddenly, solidarity gives way to particularity and gives way to taking care of your own first. Uh, 
Um, you know, it wasn't just simply a question of America first, but Germany first, Britain first, France first, Spain first, Sweden first. Uh, and the idea that countries that have obligations to each other, treaty obligations to each other, uh, were finding ways in which they could find loopholes or the small print that could enable them uh, to say, of course, we would, we would love to help you and we're bound to help you, but we're going to invoke this, uh, uh, this exemption that allows us not to send you some of the medical equipment that you're requesting or not to provide the assistance that you're requesting uh, because, well, we have a need here. Um, what the long-term implications of this are, we're still sorting through, uh, but it's clear that the European Union uh, has suffered a blow that the idea that the European Union represented a uh, association of uh, a transnational association and, and was working to uh, remove borders and barriers uh, is harder to, to, to make in May of 2020 uh, when uh, there is resentment in parts, uh, it's actually resentment across the union in different populations, either uh, in places like Spain or Italy where the, the narrative is the union failed us or in other parts of the union where the sense is, why couldn't you take care of yourself better? Why are you always coming to us with a handout? Uh, this is very much going to be a tense issue between Italy and Germany uh, in the months to come. Uh, and then of course, the solidarity relationship with the United States has been shaken uh, because the sense that the United States uh, not only was not prepared or wasn't going to give as much aid as, as allies might have expected, but was also working to uh, um, take aid or, or, or to compete uh, for medical equipment and supplies, uh, particularly the, the uh, efforts to try to, to sign contracts with German firms for uh, equipment that would be produced exclusively for export to the United States. Uh, and that has left a, a sour taste in, in some people's mouths, that uh, solidarity is all well and good until it's not. And so we're going to see what the long-term implications. It could be that this is a flash in the pan. Uh, after uh, a few months or a year, this is water under the bridge, or it could, it could presage uh, a larger split. We, again, transatlantic relations uh, were already under strain. Uh, at the end of the Obama administration, certainly accelerated during the Trump administration. Uh, and this is one more straw on the camel's back. Whether it breaks the camel's back or not, I think is too early to tell. But it's certainly going to be part of the litany of grievances. Uh, you know, the next time uh, NATO has its uh, summit, uh, there's going to be airing of grievances. Uh, and whether or not that's enough and then people move on or whether or not the, this is like accumulated scar tissue that begins to, to have an impact uh, remains to be seen. And finally, the third point uh, that I'll throw out uh, for uh, comment, discussion, and, and, and uh, pondering uh, is whether or not the pandemic, which is affecting more or less every major power in the world, there's no part of the world that is immune from it. There's apparently no population group in the world that, that has natural immunity uh, to COVID-19. So you can't, a country can't say, well, this won't affect us because somehow we will uh, be protected. Uh, every major country, every, and of course every country, uh, depending on how well it's connected into global supply and travel networks is being impacted by this. Uh, you have, you know, traditionally, or I shouldn't say, uh, for, for a number of years, uh, America's leading uh, communitarian uh, thinker and public intellectual, uh, Amitai Etzioni, has always argued that these kinds of transnational crises are what bring countries together. This is how you create cooperation. Uh, when you're faced with a problem that no one country can solve, uh, it incentivizes countries to work together, to come together, uh, to, to forge a solution. And then from that, you can, you can build uh, building blocks uh, of, of a new global order. Uh, that was his assertion with regard to international terrorism. It was validated for a few years and then somewhat uh, fell by the wayside. Uh, but Bill Gates has resurrected this idea uh, in his uh, 
relatively, I think, well-known and distributed manifesto from this past month that uh, the pandemic is the equivalent of a world war. Uh, every nation on earth uh, is equally impacted. We must all come together uh, to fight the virus. Uh, and that's, that's one possibility. The other is that um, countries, particularly the major powers, are going to look at the pandemic, just as they've been looking over the last couple of years at climate change, and saying, we're all going to be impacted. We're all going to have, uh, we're all going to take losses. But maybe my losses are, I can survive them, or I can mitigate them. But you, another competitor, another great power rival, uh, you can't. Uh, you will collapse under the pressure, or you'll be knocked down a few pegs in the international system. Uh, and so will that lead to a, a hedging of cooperation where we will say, well, of course, we're all going to cooperate to fight this scourge of humanity, but I'll help up to a point. But if the pandemic or climate change or some other crisis has the potential to take you from being here down to here, I might want to let that happen. I might want to let that uh, play itself out. And I'll take losses, you know, if I think that the losses that you're going to take may be much greater. And so I think that is, it's a possibility we have to consider because often we think of an international crisis and we think the only outcome is greater cooperation. We must all band together. Uh, and yet it's possible uh, for countries to say, I'll be hurt, but I can absorb that damage but if it takes one of my competitors or rivals out, uh, then I might be more inclined to, to let this uh, have, it, uh, have it run its course. And so, you know, again, we saw that uh, three of the major powers of the world were, were absent from the UN uh, discussions about cooperation, uh, each for their own reasons. But it says something that uh, when China, the United States and Russia all decide to absent themselves, uh, that they're, they're considering uh, the extent to which global cooperation helps or hurts their interests. And in fact, they may not want to cooperate with others if they can use their cooperation or assistance to, to gain points. So we certainly have seen this with uh, what, what is referred to as mask diplomacy, China's uh, efforts to uh, brand its aid to other countries uh, very clearly as something coming from China, not something coming from an international community, and making the case that you have to, you know, when at the end of the day, uh, remember who helped you. Uh, and it won't be an international community, it'll be a specific state. In contrast, then you know, we, people have argued, well, great, you've sent us equipment that doesn't work or is defective. Uh, Will the U.S. also try to get in on this more? We're, we're catching up to this in various parts of the world of now trying to do this as well. But again, not doing it in the name of an international community uh, or team humanity, I think, as, as Bill Gates uh, phrased it, but instead doing it as um, a specific nation state, a specific great power offering this with some, ex with some expectation that aid that is given today will be remembered uh, for future favors or future consideration. Uh, and again, it's not surprising that the concentration of Chinese aid to Italy follows on Italy's decision last year to become the first EU member to become a full-fledged participant in China's Belt and Road uh, initiative across uh, greater Eurasia. Uh, the land and maritime Silk Road uh, connections. And so I think China very much sees uh, that any aid that it's going to offer in Europe is going to have a sense that uh, having given you this aid today, tomorrow we might expect uh, some understanding or consideration. And given that uh, prior to the pandemic, the major issue dividing Europe and the United States has been uh, Huawei's provision of 5G mobile technology to European countries, which is a step the United States would like European uh, allies and partners not to do. Uh, and that uh, most, a number of European countries were still moving ahead with this. Uh, now the pandemic creates yet another uh, friction point where some countries in Europe may say, the United States wanted us not to do 5G, 
Uh, they don't offer a 5G replacement. And then when we were hit by the pandemic, they didn't really help us. And in both cases, China did. And so uh, when push comes to shove, we're going to go with Huawei and we're perhaps going to be more open and amenable to the uh, Chinese Belt and Road initiatives uh, as they play out in Europe. Again, it's, it's too early. Uh, to see what the final outline of this is going to be. But, uh, you know, this is definitely something that is now going to be added on uh, to, to these discussions. So um, with that, so let me stop with those three, the, the idea that uh, are we going to see a reorientation or reconsideration of uh, our global uh, supply chains? Uh, what is this doing to uh, alliance and partnership solidarity? Is it going to bring countries, uh, our allies and partners closer together, or uh, are we going to see some distancing? And finally, um, do we see greater international cooperation because of the pandemic, or is this going to be one more tool in great power competition uh, between the United States and China and Russia and other uh, rising and resurgent powers? Uh, those are kind of my three uh, overarching themes uh, and things that I'm going to be looking at in the in the weeks and months to come uh, in trying to assess what the uh, long term out, outlook uh, from COVID-19 is going to be. So let me uh, let me pause there and uh, check in with uh, if there are questions and comments so far and uh, go from there. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, I I have a question for you, of course, but I would like to remind everybody to submit their questions into the Q&A so we can have more of an, of an interactive discussion. Um, so let's start. The Economist just ran a cartoon depicting a boxing match between world and COVID, but with a big fighter labeled climate waiting in the wings. Yep. Do you see any indicators that the pandemic could spur any new action on climate change? And are there any new approaches based on commons-based nature of these ideas? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point, right? That uh, pandemics and, and climate change have always been connected. Um, and that this isn't just true at, at the 21st century. I mean, this is true throughout human history. Um, I am in the middle of reading a fascinating book uh, and whose title now escapes me. It's upstairs, so I can't easily go up and, and, and show it. Uh, but it's essentially saying, uh, you know, the collapse of the Roman Empire uh, due to climate and pandemic, right? That these two things were connected, that as you had climate change, uh, as we moved out of, I guess, what was called the Roman optimal climate of the first uh, several centuries, and uh, uh, you know, the, the climate shifted, we went into a little ice age, and therefore uh, harvests are affected, and pests and locusts and, and things like that. So people are weakened. And at the same time, you know, the Roman Empire create was a you know precursor of globalization and you started having more trade. And then these, you know, as diseases came in, um, also partly due to climate change. Uh, and migration due to climate change, right? That the Huns uh, were, were happy to stay in Central Asia for centuries until uh, Central Asia became less hospitable. And so then the Huns went in two directions and they, uh, they smashed against the Han Chinese and brought the Han Empire down. And then the Huns pushed all of these Germanic tribes against the Roman Empire and then they came in. Uh, that was climate driven. And then of course, if you have these migrations, then you get the great plagues uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the Antonine Plague, uh, the Plague of Justinian, so on and so forth. And so, yeah, that, that cartoon, I think, really points to this, that these are, these, are, these are connected things. We can't say, well, here's a box that says we'll put climate here and we'll put pandemic here. These things are connected. And then it's the question then of resiliency, uh, the question of uh, who aids whom. Um, what I think is likely to happen can't say that it's going to happen for sure, but my sense is we are going to see movement for, I would say, a bifurcated approach. That is that trying to have a global approach to these issues in the current system, in the current conditions we have, is just going to bring us to, to really, you know, lowest common denominator consensus solutions. What I think you're going to see perhaps uh, is groups of countries working not to stop these things, because I think uh, in many cases, we can't reverse direction. It's gonna be on mitigation. What can we do to mitigate? What can we do to switch uh, things over? What can we do to harden and strengthen our food supply uh, networks, our 
uh, cities, our you know sea coasts and the like, uh, and then that's going to become a battle of. Let me back up again. I, I start reverting to military metaphors here, uh, but it will become a competition then of innovation and technology. And the question will be: Will groups of countries make technologies and innovation available to everyone, or will they keep them restricted in the way that in the 20th century? during the Cold War, the United States and its European allies and Japan, you know, restricted the export of computers and other high tech goods to, to the Soviet bloc. And so will we see an effort that says, we're going to work on mitigation and we're gonna make it available to everyone or we're gonna work on mitigation and kind of keep it within a, a community of states uh, and you know, what happens to other parts of the world uh, you know, they will have to make their own choices. Uh, the migration question, I mean, it's interesting so, so since the, from the Economist uh, cartoon, I mean, the, you know, with climate waiting in the background and then behind that is the migration question, uh, which is that groups of people will continue to move as parts of the planet become less hospitable to, to population. And so where do people go? Uh, where will they find refuge? And then again, are we going to see global solutions or are we going to see barriers and walls coming up? So, you know, it, it bears remembering that before the pandemic hit Europe really hard in March, the, the prevailing image we were having on our TV screens uh, in February was the Greek-Turkish border uh, and effectively uh, the attempt to create a wall or barrier between Turkey and Greece to keep uh, waves of migrants from entering the European Union. So uh, as the pandemic recedes and as climate returns and as the migration question returns, is it going to be we're going to help everyone or we're going to help within? So that also bring, returns us to this question of solidarity. Uh, who is, you know, how are we going to see our obligations to, to help others? Uh, and given the rise of populism across both left-wing and right-wing populism. I mean, it has both left and right-wing variants. Uh, populism, by definition, uh, as a political movement in a country, you know, divides into there's us and there's them. And a populist says, my job is to take care of us. And what happens to them, not my concern. Uh, and so if we still have this populist strain in American politics and the politics of various European countries moving forward, uh, where people are voting for politicians and political movements that say, we're going to take care of our own, and what happens to others is not our concern, uh, then that is not going to lead to the type of broad-based global solutions that I think people, again, I don't want to keep picking on them, but people like Bill Gates have been really advocating uh, over the last several months, um, you know, unless there is a political change uh, in a variety of, of countries where populism is rejected and we return to a greater, a more international based focus. And so, you know, it's a question mark for us. We'll, we'll find out in November, both in terms of the presidential election, but just as significantly what the, what the breakdown is going to be in the Congress. Uh, because who the president is matters, but who controls the Senate, where appointments are made and treaties are ratified, uh, can be just as important. So, um, you know, we'll find out the day after election day um, what direction certainly the United States is going to move in. Germany will be going through leadership transition in the coming year, uh, and uh, whether or not. Uh, Angela Merkel is replaced uh, as succeeded by someone who is more populist or not. Open question. Italy right now has, you know, essentially a populist government. Uh, Emmanuel Macron has tried to harness populism uh, in, in his efforts to, to uh, you know, regain the political initiative in France. So open-ended question there. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so Going back to the United States' role in the world, we have Joanna Gwazdiowski. She says, so are we heading for an essentially anarchical global society, one without US leadership and with various democratic and authoritarian powers vying for influence? And what will be its ramifications? Yeah. 
Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think what we've seen over the last year validates what Ian Bremmer was writing about five, six, seven years ago about we were, mo we're moving to a G0 world, right? The idea that there is a, a, you know, a set, uh, a global leader in the United States or uh, a group of countries which work together to set an international agenda. Uh, he was already seeing the beginning signs that you know, the G7 wasn't, the United States was not going to do this, the G7 wasn't going to do it, even the G20 wasn't going to do it, and we were going to move to uh, conditions of what he had described as G0. And I think that we're seeing that now. Uh, we don't have, I mean, it, it is an interesting observation that people are saying, well, where is the United States? Why isn't the United States leading? Uh, why isn't it doing more? And partly because over the last number of years in Amer American domestic politics, uh, Americans say we've done enough. Uh, we always are called on to do things and uh, we're gonna take care of ourselves for a while. Uh, this is part of our you know, narrative collapse in terms of uh, the US role in the world that uh, a significant number of Americans, maybe not a majority, but a, a plurality uh, spread out uh, in politically important areas uh, is saying, we're not as interested in global leadership for the sake of global leadership. We could argue that that's a short-sighted approach, that American America reaps benefits from its position as a global leader, uh, but that is, that, is part of the, uh, that is part of the environment that we're in right now. Uh, how long this will last? You know, nature abhors a vacuum. Will the United States snap back? Uh, will the United States uh, regain the initiative in concert with its European allies because you know the, the dynamic of the immediate 11 9 post 11 9 period was kind of a euro American partnership for setting the global agenda uh, that of course requires repairing the the transatlantic relationship because right now that is not not going well uh, so again to some extent will depend on what happens in our November election who is elected uh, what people fill the key appointments, uh, whether or not there is receptivity in Europe, uh, and do we kind of recreate a Euro-American partnership. Uh, China is making its first bids towards uh, perhaps not global leadership as a whole, but saying that uh, China perhaps should be playing more uh, of a directing role, uh, but uh, it also is dealing with uh, countries looking at China's role and having questions about uh, whether or not China uh, is prepared to, to shoulder these burdens and whether or not China is transparent enough in what it does to engender the kind of trust uh, that you would have to, to say, well, yes, China should set the agenda or should play a, play a greater role. And to the extent that uh, there are now, not just simply in the United States, but calls in, in Europe of saying, we'd like to have a bit more understanding of, of how this uh, pandemic began in China. We'd like a bit more transparency from Beijing uh, and Beijing stonewalling that to a bit doesn't engender the kind of confidence. Uh, and so if you don't have a, a global leadership, then by default, it starts to, be, it starts to break apart into, into regions uh, or into specific countries going in their own in different directions. Uh, and uh, that is going to be, uh, I think, a trend that we may also need to be looking at. So again, some of it, I think, is going to depend on you know, what happens over the summer, what happens in our elections uh, in the fall, and then, of course, not just simply the elections, but then you know, who, who, who are going to staff the critical positions uh, to, to regain this uh, trust, uh, who, who goes to the UN, who goes to the specialized agencies, so on and so forth. But right now there is, there's definitely a leadership vacuum. It really is a situation where people are pointing fingers saying, it's your job, you should do this. You take the initiative, you take the lead. And you know, a sense of, of passing that buck from uh, one, one country to the other. Our next question comes in from Chris Butler. He asks, you mentioned security implications within supply chains. What are your thoughts about regional blocks developing in more formalized ways and potentially trading and negotiating amongst themselves? Or will multinational corporations' interests in broader markets supersede those regional security interests? It's a great question, right? Because, you know, 
I can sit in a, in an academic institution uh, and you know say this is what's going to happen or what ought to happen, but in the end, it's going. These are decisions that are going to be made simply not by governments but by companies. Uh, and the debate that I'm having with colleagues about this is how significant is this disruption? How much is it affecting a company's bottom line, and to what extent? Is it going to be once it passes, people, companies are going to make decisions to say it's all very well and good to redo, redesign our supply chains, but uh, if we can go back to the way things were, and that's the most uh, profitable, uh, then that's what we're going to do. So that's one aspect. Is what you know at the end, you know, the a company's fiduciary duty to shareholders uh, is going to win out over uh, someone saying, in the name of national security, you ought to do X, Y, and Z. Um, the real test, I think, is going to be not in the United States at this point, but what I'm really keeping an eye on is what has happened in Japan. That is that uh, when Japan, when the government of Prime Minister Abe passed their stimulus uh, pandemic bill in the diet, they incl explicitly included uh, support, a large degree of financial support for Japanese firms to begin precisely what you said, right? Pull supply chains out of China, bring them back to Japan or reorient them to, to more secure locations, right? You know, working with existing partners and allies. To me, that is, is a fascinating question is whether if, a, if, a, if governments are prepared to incentivize a redrawing of supply chains, will the private sector respond? Uh, to expect the private sector to do it on its own for the sake of uh, you know, we're asking you to do this because it's good for our national security. Those appeals have had mixed results in the past. If Japan, followed by governments in Europe, followed by the United States, say we're going to we're going to create concrete incentives for our multinationals to consciously redesign their international supply chains, not you know, not bring everything home and, and be autarkic, but to, to still have the benefits of specialization and uh, of, uh, uh, of cost differentials, but to do it in a way that is linked more with security uh, concerns, will the private sector respond? So I think that watching what happens in Japan over this coming year is going to be quite instructive. Uh, will Japanese firms take these incentives? Uh, will they begin to uh, make permanent reorientations, or will they do this on a temporary basis? And then, when the crisis is past, say, you know, our supply chains with China—that's our—that that really is our most economical option. And now that the crisis is over, we're going to return to that uh, that those sets of relations. Uh, so I think it's an open question. Uh, but it, as I said, Japan's example is quite interesting because it's the first concrete step taken by a major government to put hard money behind this request and to say we really would like for you to begin taking these steps to reorient your supply chains. So great question, uh, great follow up in, in six months time or a year uh, to see how this has played out. Again, is this a flash in the pan or is there a permanent, uh, permanent shifting? Uh, one other thing with that though, which is quite interesting, uh, is on the one hand, we can say, well, we're going to reorient our supply chains. On the other hand, we're going to look at costs. So let me just throw this out as a counter. Right? So we have Japan saying we're going to, uh, the Japanese government, we're going to do this. On the other hand, uh, we've always had concerns about European dependence on Russia for energy. Uh, we, over the last number of years, were really pressing uh, Europeans to buy more energy from us. Uh, the, the Trump equation on that was uh, if we're spending money to defend you uh, and you're spending your money uh, buying energy from Russia, whom we're spending the money to defend you from, you know, that equation is a bit out of, out of balance. Uh, the problem is, is that now in partly caused by the pandemic, partly caused by the Rus Russia Saudi oil spat of March, uh, energy prices are at historic lows. And uh, for European consumers, uh, buying expensive energy from the United States makes no sense at all. Buying low cost energy from Russia uh, makes much more sense. Uh, and uh, you know, we, 
this uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, for those that follow this issue, you know, Russia was building a second pipeline to connect Russia directly to Germany. Uh, the United States was able to impose some very last minute sanctions uh, to try to delay the pipeline, uh, which, you know, there was about 100 or so kilometers, a little bit more than a couple hundred kilometers left to do. Uh, we sanctioned, we said that if the European firms cooperating kept uh, doing so, we would sanction them. The European firm stopped. Uh, the Russians uh, finally have moved a ship into Danish waters to finish the line. Uh, and so the likelihood is, is that this second pipeline is going to be finished by the end of the year. Uh, and that Europeans will say, uh, all very well and good for us to have better supply chain connectivity for energy with the United States, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're happy to continue buying uh, a good chunk of our energy from Russia. So Japan is one example, Nord Stream is the other, and we'll see how these play out. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, next, we have a question from Archie Ilam. Uh, asking, all the themes you outlined seem to require governments to be more agile and better at delivering for their peoples. Yeah. How are we doing? <laughs> uh, probably a good time to, re to always remind that uh, when I'm wearing, if I'm wearing a Naval War College hat, I'm always speaking in a personal capacity and not, uh, not in any official one. Um, look, the, the record of governments here is, is quite mixed. Um, you know, we were tested, not only us, but Europeans, on our capacity to respond uh, quickly uh, and uh, in an agile fashion, and I think we've been found wanting. I think we've seen where the gaps are. I think we've seen where uh, years of not budgeting for these things um, because you think it's never going to happen or it will be survivable. Uh, kind of you know, like the problem that you have all throughout the Southeast United States of how much do you invest in hurricane preparedness uh, if you think that uh, the likelihood of a hurricane hitting you is is low or not that not that critical or yeah that's important but we'll just keep we can keep postponing year after year to to get our ourselves ready until you know, you're New Orleans in 2005 and you realize that uh, all of the, those deferred spending choices that you've made aren't going to help you when Katrina comes barreling down uh, on you. Um, the agility part, uh, I think, is is been tested. Our, you know, ability to kind of, you know, have the stockpiles, have the public-private partnerships in place, uh, you know, is really, uh, I think, shown in the U.S., uh, the you know the, the the fallback to the state governments and how the states are responding and the fact that in many parts of the U.S. the state governors have more trust than the federal system and I think again that's reflected in Europe that uh, the European Union has lost a good deal of credibility uh, in the eyes of, of of ordinary citizens of the union uh, and so then you you fall back to your national government or your regional government. Uh, and again, this is about spending, right? These are about spending priorities. Uh, it's about how much you're going to invest in capabilities that you may not have to use on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and then, but then saying it's worth keeping these capabilities. And you know, really, for the last 20 to 30 years, we have moved in a variety of areas to just-in-time uh, supply chains and just-in-time. Uh, funding for things and assumed that that was going to work until uh, you realize you can't ramp up production fast enough. And again, this will come back to this idea of tr trust. Do you trust these supply chains? Do you want to invest? Are we going to see movement in countries saying we're going to, to want to spend more? A very fascinating um, op-ed that came out uh, last month from um, David Barno and uh, Nora Ben Sahel. Uh, really, it was designed as a wake-up call to the Washington, D.C.-based national security community and said one of the impacts of the pandemic uh, in American domestic politics may be that people are going to say, look, national security is not about aircraft carriers and tanks and how we're going to intervene in Ukraine or defend the South China Sea. People are going to say, I want to see more of that defense spending relocated to, to public health. Um, I don't worry, you know, if I live in, well, 
if I'm in Stanford, I don't think anyone in Stanford right now is really worried about little green men uh, from Crimea showing up uh, on the streets of Stanford. But I think people are worried about COVID-19. They're worried about uh, the next catastrophic uh, flood that may come through. And you know, having another aircraft carrier uh, on deployment in the South China Sea may become a lot less important to people than saying, I'd rather you know, mothball the aircraft carrier and I want you know, more PPE, more masks, more ventilators, uh, more research on uh, vaccines, uh, more flood control mechanisms, uh, so forth. And that was the, that's their warning to the people in Washington who just say, well, yes, this is a crisis. And then when it's over, we're going to go back to, you know, how we're going to inter intervene to defend the Baltic states from Russia or, you know, how we're going to do lily pad operations in Indonesia. Uh, you could end up with, you know, people here. Paul, and again, what happens in the November campaign? Uh, or is this going to be where people start saying to their members of Congress, uh, I want to, if you vote for more defense budget increases and, you, and you, you're not voting for health increases, I'll remember that and uh, I'll replace you at the ballot box in November. So that could be an impact uh, seeing uh, either in this election cycle and perhaps in the next one as well, where we're going to redefine national security and then we're going to say, you know, defending overseas versus agility at home becomes the uh, becomes the defining factor for what we consider as national security. Next, we have a question from William Tafoya. He asks, the United Nations seems to have become the apologist for third world bullies and non-nation state political movements. The European Union, a great theoretical idea like the UN, quickly turned into a bloated bureaucracy. What's your reaction? And, and Nick, I'm sorry, just to interrupt um, before you, you get started on that one. Um, I'm going to extend the Q&A period until 1015. I know that I said that we would wrap at 11. For those who need to leave at 11, um, we appreciate you coming today, but we will continue until, because there are so many, um, what I think are interesting questions still sitting in there, I'm going to extend I'm, and to 1015. I'm, Sure, and I'm happy to even after that, as long as your Zoom subscription doesn't uh, or you don't need yeah, to we leave. We will cut out. <laughs> yeah, we'll hang I, in there with you. I will. I'm. I can. I can extend for uh, a while longer. So. Okay. Great. That's no no problem on my end. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is is that uh, people are looking at institutions of the last century, so the UN and the and its agencies, and then the European Union, and they're questioning. Uh, what did they get, right? And so your, your point about bureaucracies, right? Uh, uh, for anyone who visit, has visited Brussels, uh, you know, the, the institutions of the European Union, the, bureauc the building blocks of the bureaucracy that you see in Brussels, uh, and the, even the concept of Brussels now as a, uh, a byword for bureaucracy and, and uh, paper pushers and uh, a lot of talk and no action. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, is this going to lead to uh, what we saw after World War II, where, you know, all uh, institutions that were created after World War I were uh, pushed aside and new ones were created. This didn't happen at the end of the Cold War, but now you've seen proposals, uh, you know, should we be thinking about a new world trade, you know, something to replace the World Trade Organization? Should we be thinking about new institutions uh, uh, that are not glo necessarily global in membership, but where smaller, but where the countries are more inclined to work together and to be more productive. So you've had several members of Congress uh, over the last uh, several months talking about, you know, a new inter set of international institutions uh, that uh, would either supersede or exist alongside institutions that may be seen as dysfunctional, particularly the United Nations. Um, especially if we're back into a position where, you know, the Security Council is always going to be permanently deadlocked, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, with Russia, China, the U.S., uh, and Britain and France not able to always come together. Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting point. Now, the question is, uh, you know, it's one thing to propose, is there going to be a set of leaders that are going to move forward on this agenda? And, you know, uh, one could see what a second term Trump administration and a continuation of the Boris Johnson administration in Britain lay the groundwork. Uh, what might a uh, 
potential Joe Biden administration do in terms of, of would, I would think a Biden administration would be less interested in creating new organizations rather than trying to rehabilitate uh, the older ones. But uh, again, also depends on what the public pressure is from below. And uh, our first barometer of this is going to be when we have the next set of European parliamentary elections. Uh, because if you have a real victory for Eurosceptics and populists saying, look, the European Union isn't working and we need to really think about redesigning it, um, that, that will give us an answer there. Uh, but again, I think we're too early in this process to see how any of it is, is going to play out. Next, we have from Thomas Krantz. How would you describe the flavor or temperature of the United States' key alliances six months ahead of the presidential election? What might our allies be expected to do in this half year ahead? Uh, I think our allies are gonna wait. I think that they are looking at what is likely to happen here and uh, they're completely unsure of what is going to occur. There was a, a, a wonderful political piece from last fall uh, that circulated uh, that uh, was um, uh, Nahal Tusi wrote. Uh, and it was a series of interviews off the record with uh, personnel from embassies all across Washington saying, well, we, we're, we are informing our governments to really take seriously what a second uh, Trump administration term would look like, right? That we, you know, we're starting to calculate the odds of uh, the president's reelection and therefore what would that mean? And then we went to impeachment. Then it was, well, could he be removed? Then no, it's not gonna happen. Then it looked like he was resurging. Now the pandemic is raising questions of whether or not, uh, uh, you know, how much of uh, his reelection may now be imperiled. And so what I think you're seeing in capitals, in Tokyo, in Berlin, in Rome, in London, in Paris is, uh, let's just wait and see. Um, let's make no binding commitments. Let's not promise anything to Donald Trump uh, or take his uh, position because he may not be there come November, but let's also not, you know, start assuming that, uh, Joe Biden will be elected and therefore a lot of the problems that we've had with, uh, with the United States over the last four years will magically go away. So I think what you're gonna have now is, a, is six months of hedging, six months of a wait and see, uh, six months of let's see how it's going, you know, let's see what happens over the summer, what happens over the fall. Um, and I think our European and Japanese allies are also taking into account how volatile our politics are. Um, you know, will Joe Biden still be the nominee come summer? Uh, what implications would that have if there's, you know, turmoil within the Democratic Party and all of a sudden, you know, the expected nominee is not the expected nominee. I think that's a pretty low probability, but if you're, if you're, if you're one of the attaches sitting in Washington, you know, sending political intelligence back to your capital, uh, you are now getting, you know, used to the fact that, you know, our politics are very unstable, very, they whipsaw back and forth. Uh, you have no idea. You can't predict with any certainty. And now you can't predict with any certainty, for example, what the makeup of the Congress will be. Will the Senate flip uh, come November? And what does that mean? And so if Donald Trump comes to uh, Europe in, in midsummer with a series of proposals and says, I want you to sign on the dotted line now, uh, you may have government saying, I, we'd like to wait to see what happens in November. Uh, and so I think you're going to enter into this period. The, the relationships now, I mean, they're strained. Um, they, they're, not, they're not broken, we haven't snapped, uh, but they're under strain. Um, there is a sense, and, and there's a sense that the, you know, again, the sense of solidarity that the United States uh, and Europe have this really close connection has been, been tested a bit. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, we'll see also, some of this depends on these intra-European discussions. So, you know, Macron and Merkel talking about, you know, a more independent European security uh, position. Um, it's great talk, but until we see concrete capabilities and resources put behind it, 
um, you know, that it's still talk and it's not exactly realized action. So I, I think everyone right now is in hedging mode when it comes to this, to this question and they're waiting to see what happens in November. Our next question, uh, it comes from an anonymous attendee and it says, given that European nations seem to be hit economically differently by the virus, does a shared currency and fiscal policy potentially have any additional fragmentation risks to the greater EU? And how do you personally differentiate the EU versus NATO allegiances in the broader European context? Yeah. Oh, those are, those are, those are wonderful questions. Um, you know, the, the test of the single currency now, uh, not just simply with, with smaller European economies, but with Italy, is this, this debate over how much spending, how much debt can be accumulated uh, in terms of these disaster bonds versus maintaining the stability and robustness of, of the currency. And it's really, again, opened up this northern versus southern split uh, within the Eurozone. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, which has priority, kind of fiscal responsibility uh, or uh, spending uh, for immediate relief? Are, are you going to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, Keynesian and, you know, open up the taps and spend? Or are you going to be the equivalent of, you know, European Alan Greenspans where you really want to, uh, you know, preserve the, uh, the integrity of the, of the value of the currency and, and not do anything uh, uh, that might, might jeopardize it. Uh, you know, again, with the, this question of, of solidarity within the union of um, who will assume the burdens, who will assume short and long-term risks, who will assume, uh, you know, uh, the costs. So for example, if you, you know, I think you're, you, the attitude in Germany has been uh, and again, this is pre-pandemic. The pandemic doesn't create this, but uh, it has been a, a growing part of German politics over the last you know, five, six years is the sense that Germany is continually asked to pay for uh, things in Europe uh, and that other European states that get aid from Germany then don't really mend their ways, right? That the German bargain was, all right, we'll bail you out, but now we expect you to become more, more like us, more like Germans. Uh, and then when the, when the uh, argument is, is, well, that's not our culture, that's not our way, that's not our politics, uh, and then the Germans start getting tired of, of continually uh, being the ones, uh, um, you know, bailing out. And this has to do then with the, the union uh, as really several, three, four, perhaps even five different economic regions moving at different speeds, uh, yet nevertheless trying to impose a common currency and a common set of uh, fiscal and monetary policies, and, and we're running into, into difficulties. On the other hand, the costs of leaving the euro are so great. You know, Greece chose not to do that at the end. I don't think Italy is ever going to, to leave and, and, and try to resurrect the lira. So I think what instead you're going to have is the currency will, will remain, it'll be volatile, and these resentments will continue to build up. The EU-NATO relationship is going to be very interesting for countries that are members of both. But also, given that the three main players in NATO are all outside the EU. So Britain, Turkey, and the United States. And so when you talk about European defense, and yet the three largest military contributors in NATO are now all outside the European Union, have no seat at the EU table, uh, that will potentially lead to, to friction as well, because which should you prioritize? If you are in the EU, and in NATO, do you prioritize your EU relationships or do you prioritize your NATO relationships? And again, for the last 20 years, we have, we meaning within the alliance, have attempted to say, well, you can do both. And we're never going to ask anyone to choose between one set of, of, of solidarity and the other. But uh, now we're up against that. Uh, that uh, to what extent does Turkey, uh, as a NATO member, uh, should they be getting more COVID-19 assistance from the European Union uh, as both 
a gesture of solidarity to an ally which increasingly in recent years doesn't feel as much love from the West and therefore has tended to move more into Russia's direction? Um, and also, is that just simply good security for the EU, that uh, a stronger, happier Turkey, even if it's not in the EU, uh, helps to, to secure the European Union? Um, again, these are debates that I think we're going to see happen uh, over time. And then uh, the question of the U.S. role. Let me just, because this is a, a great seminar question, uh, Wendy, I think you should probably have another, bring another set of speakers uh, on this, because this is the, the looming elephant in the room beyond pandemic, or the looming panda, if I can cross metaphors. And that is ultimately the question of China as an as a factor in US-Europe relations, right? So the US is saying to Europe, well, we're all solidarity, NATO, and by the way, we think NATO should be playing a greater role vis-a-vis -vis China. And then European countries putting on their EU hats saying, this isn't, China's not our problem. It's a Pacific problem, not a Euro-Atlantic problem, and therefore we don't want to see NATO become more involved in uh, Asia-Pacific affairs. Uh, and so that becomes a solidarity question of uh, the, the U.S. saying, well, then don't expect us to be uh, in NATO to be there to really help you as much against the Russians if you're not prepared to help us against uh, uh, the Chinese should push come to shove there. So um, that that's a subject for an, another uh, world affairs seminar. And I, I would, uh, I might advise, you know, along with the climate and pandemic question from the beginning, I think that's a, a great topic for uh, a future seminar for for the Stanford uh, Council to 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 address. All right, we're going to go back to the audience for one last question before I go back to Wendy. Uh, the last question is coming in from Nancy Lomazzo, and uh, she asks: If Trump loses the election in 2020, will the U.S. be able to regain its leadership in the world? Can we regain the trust and recognition that we once had in the past? That that is the the $64,000 question, because if you talk to people that are part of the Biden foreign policy advisory apparatus, there really is a hope of, I know it's an overused, uh, overused word, but of a reset, right? That you can just simply press the reset button and say the last four years have been, a, you know, it's like the, the scene at the beginning of Dallas in the shower where he wakes up. It was all a dream and we can just go back to, you know, the way it was in 2016, right? Just the last four years will just be water under the bridge. Uh, uh, and uh, let's just pick up to, you know, for Biden to say as well, let me pick up for when I was vice president of the Obama administration and we'll try to make this a seamless transition from the second term of the Obama administration to the first term of the, of the Biden administration. So I think that's the hope that, that, uh, that Joe Biden will be able to do this. Um, several things though that might mitigate against that, which is the United States for the last four years has shown that it is willing to uh, snap some of its relations with Europe, uh, so that even if we say, look, we want bygones be bygones, there's now memory, there's now institutional memory that says the US did this once, it can do it again. And while I think European countries may be inclined to want to repair ties with the Biden administration, they're going to hedge this time. They're not going to just wholeheartedly say, we're just going to go back to the way it was. It's going to be, we'll be happy to try to rebuild the relationship, uh, but we are not going to be as, we're not going to do so as wholeheartedly. We're going to retain a greater freedom of action because you did it once, you might do it again. The other question again is, is the mandate that, that uh, Joe Biden will have or not have coming into the White House. Does he have, uh, will he have control of the Senate? Will he be able to pass initiatives in the Congress uh, that can help restore the relationship? in terms of the caucuses in particularly uh, not just of Republicans, but of the of newer, younger Democrats, which I think we overlook. Um, we look at, you know, the squad, right? So the, uh, you know, the four uh, young uh, members of Congress uh, who have really become the face of the next generation of progressive Democrats. Uh, they're not as focused on Europe. 
uh, Europe is is their parents or grandparents, uh, you know, foreign policy priority. They have different priorities. Uh, they are somewhat more inward looking, or they're looking southward, uh, you know, north south rather than across the Atlantic. Um, they may be less inclined to simply put the transatlantic relationship back at the uh, at the center point of U.S. foreign policy. They may be more inclined to say, it's time for us to pay more attention to the hemisphere. It's time for us to pay more attention across the Pacific. So that even if Biden wins, there's going to be a certain degree, I think. And again, who's in power in Europe? Are there people that he will have, have connections with? Uh, you know, he, if he were to, to win the election, he'll be in the last year of the Merkel administration. Uh, and then who replaces Merkel in Germany? We don't know. He doesn't necessarily have some of the connections. I don't know that he'll have the same type of relationship with Boris Johnson. So the Europeans may not be so keen on immediately resetting. And then if he doesn't control the Senate, it will, it will limit what he can do in terms of initiatives. And if, uh, depending on the makeup even of the Democratic caucus in the House, he may have uh, a growing number uh, of Democrats in the House that also are not going to say, uh, let's automatically reset with, with Europe. So I think uh, uh, simply accept, just simply saying, well, once we change, if the occupant in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue changes, that automatically leads to, to, to something different. We have these other factors to consider, uh, which may end up being constraints on, on his ability uh, to, to reset or not reset that relationship. Oh, wow. What, what a great conversation. Um, uh, Nick and Billy, thank you for joining us from oh, Carnegie thank you. Council. Um, thank you to all of our members. You've reminded me this morning how much I appreciate having these conversations with you. I've, um, I actually really enjoy seeing the questions come up in um, text format. It allows me to think about them and see the variety of them in a different way than we do when we're just, um, you know, handpicking people out of a, an in-person audience. So um, I would encourage everybody that has tuned in that's still listening um, to send us any feedback that you have on the format that we're using. We still obviously have a lot of uh, loose ends to tidy up in terms of using the new platform. Um, but we're looking for uh, feedback from everybody that participated today um, for what worked for you. Um, you know, definitely send something along if there was an issue that we needed to clean up and work on. Um, but what, uh, what made today's um, program interesting to you? Um, as we are looking into this new space, uh, that it's that type of value that only you can give us the feedback on. We can take a guess um, on our end, but what we're seeing um, as hosts and uh, speakers and, and panelists is not how you're experiencing it. So we hope to hear from you. Um, at the beginning of the chat, I put my um, a, a contact for Shira Tarantina, who is our new program manager. Shira at worldaffairsforum.org is where you can send emails with thoughts about um, the format and feedback. Thank you again, guys, for being part of this. I want to also Oops. thank uh, George Paik, who is the chair of our program committee, a uh, longtime friend of the, and supporter of the forum, um, who uh, you know, was uh, a, a big part of bringing us online today. So thank you, everybody, and I hope to see you again. We'll be in touch soon about a follow-up conversation, indeed, exploring that relationship with China. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Well, thank you.